Um, but it's my pleasure um, to introduce Sarah, who um, I'm sure many of you know, um, or at least have profited uh, in a culinary way already from <laughs> your snack tonight. Um, but Sarah's an old friend of the workshop. It's r a real pleasure to have her back in the space. Uh, and we're here to celebrate Loves You, which is her newest collection, um, which combines uh, poetry with multiple forms, including recipes. Um, as Legea herself writes, um, the book has a jittery, wise, cracking wisdom, and it's a great meditation on the immigrant's haunted inheritance, um, which I'm sure we'll talk about more in a second. Um, she's also the author of Matadora and Delivered, both of which I think we did events here, um, as well as one of the co-founders of Kundiman. Is anyone here a Kundiman fellow or board member? Let's give a, sh a big applause for Kundiman. Um, as well as a director, uh, the director of creative writing at Fordham. So uh, thank you all for being here. Let's give Sarah a big round of applause. Thank you. It's so good to be here with you guys. Um, I'll just say thank you, thank you to the workshop, thank you to Ken and Sophia and all the lovely interns who have made tonight possible. And thank you, I want to say, to Mountain Province, which is where the beautiful Bibinka has come from. So check them out. Williamsburg, Brooklyn, they're amazing. Uh, <laughs> so I'll just say like something about the recipe as a poetic text. Thinking about what do we as artists right now, like what is our job? What are we to do? And it's a very bewildering time. I don't know about you guys, but when we have a regime that is overtly anti-immigrant, anti-brown, anti-black, like what do you do? Um, how do you speak back to that? Um, what I love about the recipe is that it's an authoritative text. It's, it's in the imperative. So do this and do this and do this. And then some kind of alchemy is possible. Right? And I was thinking about this years ago when I first started watching cooking shows on the um, cooking channel. And I was like, why do I love this? Like, <laughs> why do I feel like I'm going to eat something and I'm not? <laughs> but they're talking about the food and they're clattering around the kitchen. And I'm thinking, that's for me. But the evocation of the recipe the text of the recipe can elicit a kind of magic. So that's what this book, what I'm trying to do in this book. So um, I'll read you uh, an actual recipe. So all these recipes in here are actually, you can make them. Um, and this particularly for me is like a kind of spell, right? Um, you put things together and something happens. So this is called, um, Water, watermelon agua fresca for when you need me. And the thing is, like, I wanted watermelon agua fresca, and then I tried to find a recipe for it. Um, and so I already knew the title before it sort of came into being. So here's the actual recipe. So it's 15 cups of watermelon, one quart of pink grapefruit juice, um, half cup of chopped mint, half cup of um, lime juice, a quarter, a quart of ginger ale, and one bottle, whole bottle of white wine, um, and ice. <laughs> Doesn't that sound good, yeah. right? Um, puree the watermelon in a blender till smooth, pour into a large bowl and let stand for 15 minutes. Skim the foam from the surface and discard. Um, set a fine mesh sieve over a large pitcher and strain puree into pitcher. Stir in the grapefruit juice, ginger ale, mint, lime juice, and white wine. Serve in ice-filled glasses and know how much I love you. It's like, you know. <laughs> Didn't it feel like kind of summer and we were gonna sit together on some veranda like with these glasses? That's what I want. Um, okay, just a few more pieces. Um, okay. okay, so. Do you guys know about these cookies called Filipinos? No. I thought it was a joke. You, okay, so there are cookies called Filipinos, and they're actually the best-selling cookie. Delicious. <laughs> and the best-selling cookie in Spain. So you think about all these Spaniards eating, happily eating Filipinos, right? <laughs> so I was in Madrid a couple years ago, and there was a gelato place, and 
literally the name of the gelato flavor was pulverized Filipinos <laughs> in white chocolate gelato. And I was like, oh my God. So um, I did a little research. So here's an epigraph from Nabisco, Iberia. Uh, okay, so this is literally from their website. Filipinos, perfect combination of real chocolate and crunchy biscuit creates their delightful taste and texture. There are three delicious flavors available, white chocolate, black chocolate, and milk chocolate. Okay, and so the, this poem is a cento, so it's kind of a collage of different things. So on August 26, 1999, then Philippine President Joseph Estrada called the brand an insult. So the government of the Philippines filed a diplomatic protest with the government of Spain and the European Commission. I like it because it means we are small and cute and sweet. <laughs> Former Foreign Secretary Domingo Saison reportedly saw, said he saw nothing wrong with the use of Filipinos as the brand name for the cookies, noting Austrians do not complain that the small sausages are called Vienna sausages. <laughs> do citizens of Berlin get upset that they gave the name to the Berliner pastry? What about the Danish and the Danish pastry? Or Cubans? Actually, they taste pretty good. Filipinos are produced by Artriarch, a Spanish brand that is part of the UK's United Biscuit. Its website claims that Filipinos are the leading chocolate biscuit in Spain. The Spaniards Christianize the Philippines, which is a good thing. However, education to the masses, government, modernity, and technology was introduced by the Americans. Thus, I think that Phil the Philippines is much better during the American colonization. Attaching the name Filipinos to a sweet product with a hole in the middle is, that is consumed for pleasure and contains little nutritional value is not very charming. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, and then right after that, there's this crazy recipe. It's my husband's recipe for lychee macarons. So I was just like, instead of eating Filipinos, maybe eat these instead. Um, thank you. Um, so I'll read like, yeah, two more pieces. So this epigraph, okay, so this is called Thunderdome, and the epigraph is from an article called The Cost of Caring the, from the New Yorker, April 2016. And so it's looking at, it was looking at uh, Filipino caregivers in the United States. So here's the epigraph. When Emma realized that her white collar job in the Philippines would never pay her enough to send her children to college, she came to New York and became a nanny. I have this really vivid image of her on a bench in Central Park, feeding this white baby with a pink spoon. It was fall and it was a bit chilly. And I thought to myself, you lost your mother. The baby's spank good, ba brand spanking new. It's like I got used to the smell of her skin. You know, the baby grew slim and tall, like a clover. She studied at the Sorbonne. She made clothes for fashion shows, for people covered in blue diamonds. Surely you are rich over there in the abroad. It's not like here. They are family, I love them. The oldest keeps asking me, do you really love me? When I'm married, will you take care of my children? I wanted my poem for us to suck on, like an IV connected to the best iced tea in the world. What is it to lie back in the best iced teas, the fronds of spearmint around you, a blanket of rice, a sparkler of oil in black pots? I knew you were cooking and that I could be big for my time the bears of language would have no further alternative. We would fall into each other's stews and aromatic dough. We'd wash our hands together with sugar and salt and yellow flowers. Let's hand each other honeycomb with honeycomb in our hair. Um, oh, okay, so this last poem, I just, I really wanted to read it to you if I didn't leave, okay, here it is. So, I wanted to write an ancestor poem, like calling the ancestors, like the wisdom, where are you, where are you? And I was like pleading for this kind of guidance. And then this kind of crazy voice came to me. Because I was like, where are you? Why aren't you here? Okay, so here's the voice. Dear, and then you can put your name. Dear, put 
safety goggles on and look into the mink mirror. See decaying flutes, master cheeses, and butt soft cowboy boots. Walk with a falcon on your shoulder, a yellow gemstone in your ear. I want what you already have, which is pork chopau in a hand-me-down handbag. I'm telling you, yes, riboflavin plants with questing pink-fired petals exist as you put your hands on the heart of yourself. Talk softly in your metronome. I have been following you up river since the day you were born. Your mother, even if she didn't know it, blew into a bugle. All of us who came before, we slapped each other on the back in jubilation. We ate nachos and sang old songs. All of us, your people, hanging off our banca and saluting an enamel sun so that you might have a good time. Draw the map right in the treasure. It doesn't even matter what it is anyway. We are your orange commanders signaling, signaling to each other and flattening against the blast of fusion turbines. You've been saying, where are you, where are you, where are you? I've got my foot in your vagina and you have to ask that? You already knew what I was going to say. Suck it to them. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. It's like what my ancestors said. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to introduce the fabulous, the fabulous Jessica Hagedorn. I, I just can't tell you how excited I am to share the stage with these amazing um, Penex writers. Like, it's just a dream come true. So Jessica is to be believed. Um, I remember being assigned um, the book Dog Eaters uh, when I was a senior in college. And I was like, what? What? So I wrote a little poem, which is my introduction. OK. I saw her in the book, in the leavenings of what could happen, potential communion, wafer of pages pro-offered, the carvings of the face not unlike mine, mine for the taking on the cover. I saw her book, I believed her book, and I heard the lilting of my family voice, a fire hose of a matter of course, belonging, without trying, without effort. I heard the prayer of this book as a compass rose, an unfolding of hard-won, hard-pinked petals. Thank you, Jessica. Well, you know, Filipinos are delicious. Um, <laughs> when I first, one of my first trips to Madrid, I was really hungry and broke. And um, I went into a little like bodega, you know, and I had very little money and I, they had them right by the cash register and I thought, Filipinos, I didn't know anything about them. This was um, back in the 90s. And so I bought them and I ate them and I thought, well, I'm eating my own history. So, uh, and they were cheap. <laughs> but then the next time I visited Spain, I got them purposefully and tried to bring them back, make an altar out of them, you know, um, in my apartment in New York, but they started melting, and so I had to eat them again. So um, <laughs> anyway, I'm rather fond of that cookie or donut or whatever it is. It's very bizarre. Um, I want to thank Sarah for bringing us all together. I think this is wonderful and generous of you to do. And with the Bibinka and everything, I mean, you are one of the most generous writers I know. And thank you for that poem. And thank you for having us here celebrating with you, with your new book. Um, it, it's really fun. And it will be fun, Ligaya. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, I'm going to read a, a little excerpt from Dog Eaters. I think people who know my work understand that food is a very profound metaphor uh, for me. 
it's never just about the food. And um, I think that the idea of even, um, some people really hated my book because of the title, they couldn't get past it, but I really wanted to, what am I doing wrong, Ken? <laughs> oh, because I can really hear myself. Um, is this better? Um, I really wanted to sort of turn that shame on its head. Um, and I realized there's a lot of animal totems in my work and always food, food, food. So I thought, well, I'm going to, you know, choose this little section for tonight's reading, and it's called High Society. And it's told in the voice of an eight-year-old narrator um, named Rio. And it's about her chaotic family, and some of them are Spaniards, and some of them are Filipinos, and it all mixes up at Christmas. And it's the food that tells the story. Oh, and it takes place in the 50s, this section of her childhood. When my father's mother, Socorro Pertiera Gonzaga, visits us all the way from Spain during the crazy Christmas holidays, we children have to be on our best behavior. We call her Abuelita. She is a widow like my mother's mother, Narcisa Divino Logan, whom we address as Lola. My parents host Bienvenida parties in Abuelita's honor, and the entire Gonzaga clan in Manila attends. Uncle Agustin and Tita Florence, my favorite cousin Pucha and her brother Mikey, my antisocial uncle Esteban and Tita Menchu with their grown-up sons, my cousins Eddie, Ricky, and Claudio, who we call Ding Ding. <laughs> Plus Eddie's wife Nana and Ricky's wife Christina. Nana smokes too many cigarettes, is painfully thin, and is considered one of the best dressed women in Manila, second only to Isabel Alacran. Nena survives on a diet of ice cream and true colas, which she consumes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Cousin Ding Ding is in his early 20s, always comes alone to our parties and leaves early. He adores my mother and entertains her with obscene jokes. My father avoids him. Everyone in the family suspects Ding Ding likes boys. No one discusses it openly. My relatives make me sick sometimes, kissing and fawning over Abuelita Socorro like they do. Tita Florence and Uncle Agustin think that Abuelita Socorro will die soon and leave them her sizable fortune. My mother, who's the only one who treats her like a regular person, says none of it matters. At our lavish Christmas parties, our brilliant genius cook, Pasita, creates sumptuous feasts under my mother's direction. Abuelita prefers rich foods covered with creamy sauces. She loathes vegetables and fruits of any kind and never eats anything raw or green. I feel like a conejo, she says, waving away the bowl of salad, which Ida offers to her. All that lettuce gets stuck in my throat. Abuelita Socorro makes the sign of the cross, makes clucking sounds with her tongue at her own revelation. Everyone at her guest of honor's table, decorated with a red tablecloth and a miniature Christmas tree centerpiece of blue tulle, falls silent. My Abuelita seldom speaks, and when she does, it's usually in lisping Castilian Spanish, which my father has to translate for some of us. But this time, she has spoken in English, which sounds bizarre. My father pats her on the arm to reassure her. Enjoy yourself, mama. Eat whatever you want, he says to Abuelita in Spanish. He and my mother are the only adults in the family who don't call her mommy darling. Pasita roasts baby lechon and bakes three-tiered cakes oozing custard, guava jelly, sugar, and cream. She calls them Gonzaga cakes. Pasita also makes the best leche flan in the world, not too eggy, but firm, with the bittersweet flavor of blood orange and burnt sugar as the perfect counterpoint. Abelita Socorro practically swoons when she eats it. Flan is all I can stand to eat at these family fiestas. I help myself to three or four pieces, maybe more. 
I refuse to eat flan in other people's houses. I never order it in restaurants. After Pasita's ethereal concoctions, all the rest are disappointments. You're insane, my cousin Pucha says, piling her plate high with thick slices of lechon meat, crispy skin, and mounds of rice with lechon gravy from the decadent buffet table. Why don't you eat real food, she asks me. What Pucha doesn't know is that when all the guests have gone and only the elders of the Gonzaga clan are left on the candlelit terrace, I will sneak off to that little room behind the kitchen for a secret midnight feast with my other grandmother, Lola Narcisa. She is never included in the festivities, and she never complains. We will eat with our hands. Rice, slices of green mango with bagoong, salt fish, adobong kangkong, and more leche flan. Yeah. Woo Who invented leche flan? Ooh, a post-colonial panel. <laughs> Who invented bibinka? We could go on and on. But this is my real pleasure to introduce our next reader. She writes the Hungry City column for the New York Times and is a contributing editor at T Magazine. She also writes for the Times Book Review, the New York Review of Books, and the New Yorker. Her essay, Born in the USA, The Rise and Triumph of Asian American Cuisine, was selected for the inaugural edition of the Best American Food Writing just last year. Now, I'm a huge Hungry City fan. It's never just about the food. Ligaya Michon makes our city and its immigrant enclaves come alive in poetic and unexpected ways, writing about the amazing unsung people behind those exquisite hand-pulled noodles and that funky, glorious sisig we consume with such abandon. Ligaya Michon. Sorry, just before we start, we just want to say, please no photos of Ligaya on social media. I just want to say that. I'm a secret agent. Thank you. Jessica, thank you so much. I hope I can live up to that. And coming after Jessica Hagedorn, oh my god, how can I do this? Sarah, thank you so much for having me here tonight. And thank you to the um, Asian American Writers Workshop. Uh, I've I've read here once before, and I'm so delighted to be back. Um, I've been told that I need to give context for my piece, uh, which is that, so it seems like every year for the past five or six years, somebody in the food world has said, this will be the year of Filipino food. <laughs> Filipino food's moment has come, and then it hasn't. And, but more and more Filipino restaurants have been opening up outside of immigrant enclaves. And finally, last year, the New York Times asked me to write a piece that would be a kind of primer for people unfamiliar with Filipino food that would introduce them to it. So I, I didn't actually grow up eating Filipino food myself. My mother is Filipino, but she is not a cook, as she will herself acknowledge. And um, I really only came to know Filipino food as, as an adult in my working life. So for this piece, I, I felt like I really needed to consult experts, so I canvassed all of my mother's friends and all of my friends, including um, Sarah and Jessica. And I asked them to tell me what would be the five dishes that are most essential to someone who wants to know something about Filipino cooking. And they all gave me five completely different dishes. <laughs> I had a gigantic spreadsheet. I didn't know what to do. So I wrote this piece. And afterwards, my mother said, how could you not include pinak bet? So <laughs> there will be holes. I'm, I'm going to read this. I hope it doesn't take too long. And um, I should also add, I didn't grow up Although my mother speaks something like four or five different Philippine languages, she didn't teach any of them to me. So some of my pronunciations may be wrong. So if you know the correct pronunciation, could you just call it out? And maybe then we can all practice saying it together. In 1883, Jose Rizal, the future hero and martyr of the Philippine Revolution, was a homesick medical student abroad in Madrid. His longing for bagaong, a paste of seafood, salted and left to ferment until it exudes a fathomless funk, 
grew so great that his worried family in Manila dispatched a jar, but it broke on the ship, releasing its scent and reportedly terrifying the passengers. <laughs> Today, bagaong and other Filipino foods are finally entering the American mainstream, more than a century after the United States Navy sailed into Manila Bay, sank the Spanish Armada, and took control of the archipelago, a restive colony of around 7,100 islands in 180 languages. Americans of Filipino heritage now make up one in five um, of all Asian Americans, second only to Chinese in number, and the largest percentage of immigrants serving in the United States military were born in the Philippines. Other Asian cuisines have been part of the American landscape for decades, but only in recent years have Filipino dishes started gaining recognition outside immigrant communities at restaurants like Maharlika in New York, Bad Saint in Washington, D.C., and Lhasa in Los Angeles. The flavors of Filipino cooking, like Rizal's broken jar of bagong, still have the power to startle those unfamiliar with them. Although Filipino food draws on early encounters with Malay, Chinese and Arab traders, as well as centuries of Spanish occupation, its profile is distinct, salty and sour above all, with less of the mitigating sweetness and chili-stoked fire found in the cooking of its Southeast Asian neighbors. Bagaong, ranging from muddy brown to plumeria pink in color, commonly made of tiny krill, anchovies, or bonnet mouths, brings to soups and stews a depth of flavor that evokes cheese and teared in caves and aged steak with an extra dimension of ocean floor. It also may be eaten straight, daubed on rice or anointing slices of green mango. Along with its byproduct, patis, it's an essential seasoning that claims a place on the table next to suka and banana ketchup, as much a condiment as an ingredient. As such, it's part of what the Manila-born histori food historian Doreen Fernandez termed a galaxy of flavor adjusters that define how Filipinos eat. Seasonings added to dishes after they're served in trickles and pinches, according to each diner's taste. A chef feeding Filipinos must sublimate ego and accept that no dish emerges from the kitchen fully finished. A meal is a joint effort between cooks and eaters. If bagaong is the salt, suka is the sour lifeblood of the cuisine. Extracted from sugar cane or the sap from coconut trees or nipa palms, it was originally a necessary preservative in a warm climate. How to take the bounty of fish from the surrounding seas and make it last. Cure it in suka and it becomes kinilao an ancient recipe that may have been one of the earliest forms of ceviche. To this might be added the bite of ginger, the silkiness of coconut milk, or a sunny kiss of calamansi, which has a sharper sting than lime. For another staple, daing nabangus, milkfish is relieved of its bones, splayed and soaked in vinegar overnight for tenderness, then crisped in a pan. You can eat the flesh with a spoon. Lumpia, cousins to Chinese spring rolls, are dunked in sao sao <laughs> which may be as straightforward as vinegar with a stutter of raw garlic. The rolls come fried to a crackle or fresh with uncooked doughy skins that suggest crepes and filled with anything from ground meat to hearts of palm to whole green finger chilies, a variation called, rightly, dynamite. Vinegar is the undertow too in adobo, perhaps the best known of Filipino dishes, whose ingredients and method predate its Spanish name. At its base, adobo is a long braise of meat in vinegar and garlic, but other ingredients are up for debate. Some swear by soy sauce, while others dismiss it as an import. Some stir in achuete oil, coconut milk, sugar, or squid ink. Of all Filipino dishes, adobo has the most leeway for a cook's imagination, hubris, art, or bigoted sense of one's own mother's love and greatness, <laughs> the novelist Gina Apostol said. There are nearly as many manifestations of adobo as there are Filipinos. But is adobo the dish that speaks most directly to the Filipino soul? Ms. Fernandez argued otherwise in favor of sinigang, a soup she described as the dish most representative <laughs> of Filipino taste, in part because it's adaptable to all classes and budget. Recipes differ, but the goal is the same, a sourness so profound that the first sip should make you shudder. The souring agent in sinigang changes by the map. It might be tamarind, guava, alibangbang leaves, Kamayas, batuan, or unripe pineapple, whatever is on hand in the region. Place matters to Filipinos who often have tangled roots as a result of internal migration and speak multiple languages. Still, no one dish can sum up the Filipino palate. A feast of different flavors is optimal, said Nicole Ponseca, who runs Maharlika and Jeepney in New York. Sauces meld, complement, make whole. To balance the sourness of adobo and sinigang, she suggests kare kare, 
a nutty sweet stew of oxtail, oxtail bok choy, string beans, and eggplant, traditionally simmered with ground peanuts and achuete oil. Peanut butter, a modern substitute, lends voluptuousness. The history of karakare is often traced to a 20-month interregnum in the 18th century when the British wrested Manila from the Spanish. Indian cooks attending the Royal Navy brought the name and notion of curry to the islands and had to make do with local spices. Karakare, sinigang, and adobo are likely to appear on most Filipino menus in the United States, from turo turo steam table joints to sophisticated restaurants. So too is dinaguan, a pork blood stew that can pose a challenge even for Filipinos. Uh, the opaque stew, classically loaded with offal, is often passed off by Filipino immigrant parents as chocolate meat <laughs> to their suspicious children. Uh, King Fajanakong, the, uh, the chef of Kuma in New York, remembers wondering, why was it so dark? But the mineral-rich blood is what gives the stew its ballast and faintly metallic hint of a licked knife. It must be cooked carefully so that the blood doesn't congeal. Done right, it turns to velvet. If cooking is a vehicle for memory, for many Filipinos, the dishes of their heritage are inseparable from days of celebration. It's considered particularly lucky to eat pancit on birthdays, their uncut strands promising long life. The name of the noodles is derived from a Hokkien phrase for fast food. Like their Chinese antecedents, they come in different shapes and textures. Mickey made with egg, bihon, rice, sotang hon, mung bean, and canton wheat. <laughs> Uh, recipes might include sluices of soy sauce and calamansi and toppings of shrimp heads, quail eggs, shucked oysters, or chicharron. For the highest occasion, there can be only one centerpiece, lechon, whole roasted pig. It's shining, lacquer-thin skin, primed to shatter. It's trendy here to go head to tail, but there it's just a way of life, Mr. Fajanakong said. After a party, the lechon is broken down. You use the head for sisig sizzle of jowl and ears, trotters for adobo, make dinaguan with blood and innards and turn lefters, leftovers into paxiu, yes. <laughs> a vinegary stew contoured with a pate-like liver spread. The backdrop to these dishes is always rice. Its earthy scent is the constant when you walk into a Filipino home, almost a ripening in the air. To Miss Fernandez, rice, rice was the shaper of other foods, its soothing blandness allowing other dishes to be stronger in contrast. Glutinous rice is used, too, for kakanin, a genre of snacks that includes puto, puto, <laughs> little steamed cakes of ground rice and coconut milk, often accompanying dinaguan, suman, logs of sticky rice wrapped in banana leaves and thick gilded rounds of bibinka, perfumed with coconut and somehow fluffy and chewy at once. Uh, some popular desserts that have European origins are now thought of as wholly Filipino, wobbly leche flan, custard under a gooey drape of caramel. Sans Rival, a dacquoise-like palimpsest of cashews, meringue, and buttercream, which the chef Nora Daza served in the 1970s at her Paris restaurant, Ozil Philippines, to the likes of Brigitte Bardot and Simone de Beauvoir. And Mango Royale, a crema de fruta turned icebox cake, with layers of cream and mangoes teetering on overripe. Beyond these greatest hits are regional specialties, which Romy Doratan, the chef of Purple Yam and a native of Bicol in southeastern south Luzon, wishes would get more attention. At Purple Yam, he makes laying, taro leaves simmered in coconut milk. I included this one because this is my favorite dish. <laughs> Nobody else had it on the spreadsheet. <laughs> um, taro leaves simmered in coconut milk until lush. But which regional specialties does he want to see more of? He laughed. There are so many islands. He said, even I do not know. I'm so honored to introduce K. Ulandai Barrett, also known as Brown Round Boy, a poet, performer, advocate, and educator, author of the 2016 poetry collection, When the Chant Comes, I believe there are copies in the back, um, a Campus Pride hotlist artist, trans justice funding project panelist, and trans 100 honoree. Their work has appeared in numerous publications and anthologies, and they've received more prizes and awards than I could possibly list. But, the best biography I could offer of Kay is the very first line of prose that greets you on the homepage of their website. Seeking justice and snacks for a better universe. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if that were everybody's mantra? Snacks matter. Food is a cultural inheritance. Sometimes it can divide us, but it can also be the one thing that connects us. I believe that the true test of a cook and a writer 
is what they can create when there's nothing in the fridge, only what has been rejected, sidelined, or simply not seen. In an interview with the Lambda Literary Foundation last year, Kay said, as a person of color, I'm accustomed to making something from scraps. I've been taught to make brilliance from heartache. Please welcome Kay. <laughs> Hey y'all, how's everybody doing? I mean, I don't know how I'm doing. I just got an intro by the guy. I just saw Sarah Gambito and I just, Jessica Hag. I, I'm just gonna read poetry. <laughs> Epigraph. Poem is titled The Groove of Tito Bong. All the poems I'm reading are from my new book, um, More Than Organs. So it's all new. The groove is so mysterious, we're born with it, and we lose it, and the world seems to split apart. Linda Berry. On the weekends during lunch, a cigarette balanced on a grin, barbecue marinade of RC Cola, B96 radio, blaring bass, Tito Bong made the meat. <laughs> Other days, he would call collect, tired, broke, she left me. He would croon somewhere jukebox, somewhere speaker, like a cough reached for air. Tito, a grown man brown, mud thick arms, bull of a face, soften when the girl cousins dressed him up in lace. Mama's best Avon lipstick samples sparkle bullets on cheekbone while he danced cha cha. They dipped together under summer moon. His sad melted like butter. Tito had no bed. In the back porch, next to roaches, he slept on a fold-out besides taped Polaroids of his parents waving. This, this is right before they left home, he'd tell you. We would peek through the screen door, watch him dance alone, beer bottles, a chorus behind, as if to wail was so simple. At the same time, as he rested, he was still on the way out. Harmonies hummed him into snores, the tape deck digging holes the size of his heart. Also, the groove. Also, the bagoong. Also, the give up. Also, he always knew all the words to every song in every language. The dance this country made him do, made him ghost. Thank you. So this poem uh, is called Jungle Asian. Do people know that term? Yeah. I mean, I, I'd be a little concerned if I was in this room and we didn't. Uh, <laughs> you know, the brown Asians, the war Asians, you know what I'm saying? So um, when I say Jungle Asian, I'll hold up my hand. And if you want, you can say it or not. You can stomp or not. It's a longer piece. Jungle Asian. Nana used to make a toothpick of fish bone after cleaning out the cheeks next to the gills. I ate the softest part. Aunties chime in like we was on camera or some shit. Jungle Asian. Domestic workers in the background of the big Asian movie who look downward but send their kids money for books. Jungle Asian. Check the tags on the t-shirts. Swap the sale tags like the way we swap names to get here. Jungle Asian. Lola makes halo halo and necklaces. We've sambaguita Pacific Jasmine together like she stepped on sand. Jungle Asian. Coconut oil on brown skin. Coconut oil on hair. On any snack ever, coconut oil, jungle Asian. <laughs> Brown like baked pandesal, fresh from that oven, not no light mother of pearl shit, jungle Asian. Spam for breakfast, jungle Asian. <laughs> Spam for lunch, jungle Asian. Rosary beads as backup phone call across on breath of chest bone. Remember, we weren't asked here. We were forced here. Invitations don't clean up people's bile or ungrateful children or are told they are part of the family when they ain't seen their real blood or banana leaves in years. Jungle Asian, tell you what, Dito says. As he misses a sentence to recall his smashed face on ground, machine gun cracks his name into skull still. Jungle Asian. Mahjong Big Win means new shoes for everybody. A black label whiskey shot to remind us even our truth stings. Jungle Asian means knocks. You look good. I ain't knock 
Ga! An element of surprise means brown knuckles on white boys' faces on schoolyard concrete saying, ew, I bet your family eats dogs. Jungle Asian. Balisong, safety unhinged as double blade, your tongue taught to pirouette, grace air with shimmer nobody ever sees. That attack or that smart theory insult coming, jungle Asian. That starter jacket hustle, jungle Asian. That calling card shuffle, jungle Asian. That Honda Civic, slow stroll on any Saturday come springtime, you can hear two blocks away, jungle Asian that sleeve of ink on your arm because your people are waves and snakeskin means we take thorns of calamansit, prick ourselves with both the tart and the sharp, make our celebration ritual some kind of psychological struggle. Jungle Asian. That too casual clarification at dinner over which war, uh, when did Spain come, when did Spain came, and when Japan came, and when America never left, and what year did China, did the French ever, is that why we like baguettes? <laughs> Jungle Asian. Hello, my name is Jungle Asian. Asian. I wiped up tables, coily car freedom from cops like my ancestors with machete. My ancestors out on weekend nights, pressed in zoot suits, about to be handcuffs. Like every pop and lock, every crew, their sleeves rolled up to balance the gravity against their bodies. Jungle Asian. Maybe the world is wild out there. But my people, my people cackled when bombs made blossoms carried beats in their hips as the carnage came. Jungle Asian, my dearest people, jungle Asian, make constellation of ball gowns in the most remote provinces pushed out to Tampa, DC, LA, Chicago, Nolens, my bading and baklatita sparkle, put bun sit and blush on before and after that storm comes. They stay glorious, jungle Asian. Tell us a fire is made for killing, and we'll show you a dance floor and the best bandan you've ever seen. Jungle Asian, in any neighborhood where elders can't help but do the electric slide on a Saturday, and all they got for another, for this life, for at least one song, is shine, shine, shine. Jungle Asian. This last poem, and I just want to thank the three of you. I feel like, you know, you're like, I really want to see Jessica Hagedorn speak again. I want to see Sarah Gambito read poetry. Oh my God. I really want to read Ligaya. Oh my God. All at once. It was just so much. I'm a little overwhelmed. So let's give Sarah and everybody a big round of applause. Tapos, <laughs> ang last poem ko, entitled. Aunties love it when the seafood is on sale. <laughs> y'all laugh, but we all know it's true. <laughs> in the summertime, the women in my family spin sago like planets. Make even Saturn blush. They split leaves of Kong Kong with riverbed softness. They are precise. Measure rice by palm lines with laughter in seasoned broth made from creatures' last gasps. You'd swear they were teenagers again, talking gossip, stretch limbs, elastic, durable, like seaweed. Come dinner time, skilled mouths slurp through the domes of shrimp and crab. They prize the fat. The angles of their teeth snap, splinter claw, snap sinew, dip tart into sweet, then back again. Bitterness, balance, succulence on succulence is to find flesh, even from the smallest of spaces. Women who swallow whole, who make a pile of bones, who suck teeth, taste every morsel so that all that is left is a quiet room and shells of what once was. To the daughters of dried fishnets, whose dreams dragged on sand, dragged to this country, they bring home recipe years later, flick joints of garlic, salabat to the sick, culinary remix, teach cousins this in this cold weather, this is how you stay alive. Morning the Midwest by taste bud. Afterwards, they keep the ocean husks for another meal because to get a good deal is to double. And anybody from the island will tell you, 
That is where the true flavor is. And what is hunger anyway but the carving out of emptiness, the learning to always save something for later. Thank you. what we'll do. I have a question for each of our beautiful um, readers, and then I thought we could open it up for some of your questions, and we'll have a conversation. Does that sound good to you? Okay. Um, so yes, if I could have everybody come up here. Um, so I'll ask a kind of two-part question, and it's occasioned by thinking about Legaius piece. I loved I feel like in the best way, I'm, I'm really hungry right now. <laughs> when, um, throughout the readings, when uh, people would mention food, like, just there would be this eruption of like, mm. <laughs> um, So I want to ask each of you, um, uh, Lagaya had a phrase like, what is the dish that speaks to your Filipino soul? And I know yours was first laing, so I'm going to challenge you to think of something else when I come to you. So like, what is the dish that speaks to your Filipino soul? And maybe what's a memory that's attached to that, like in terms of you making that choice? Do you know what I mean? Um, so I'll just begin with that and say, does somebody want to start? Um, you know, I... Am I not doing this again? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come on. I was thinking about why we did not have Pinak Bet on that list because we actually did, but you were so strict. You <laughs> said only pick five. And I remember trying to talk about Pinak Bet, and, um, you know, but it's hard to choose the one. I mean, I really think that that's a tough question because I think it would have to be adobo, you know? I mean, I don't eat much meat these days, but if you tell me that we're going to have some adobo, I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I was, and I think it's because it's an easy one to pull off. I remember when we first immigrated to this country and we were living in San Francisco and there weren't, I mean, it was the 60s, so there weren't a lot of um, visible Filipinos. There wasn't like a community you could see, you know. So my, my mother, who was a great cook, um, she would go to Chinatown and improvise, you know, like, oh, they have this and they have that, you know, and that was the big, you know, discovery that we could approximate something. But the easiest thing for her to throw together would be adobo because you could always find the vinegar and the soy sauce and, you know, but, but, and then I just grew to make that my Proustian, you know, donut or something. But I think there's some, Pinak Bet to me is deer. There's nothing like it. Uh, so I'm gonna throw like a curveball. <laughs> I haven't gone to a restaurant and I, uh, my mom used to make miswa. Do you all know what miswa is? Yeah. It's like this thin, delicate noodle. It's like silk. And if you touch overcook it with like, of course it has like chicharron or, or, or um, pork belly in it, and then it has shrimp in it. Um, it turns to mush. It's so finicky. You have to have such a careful hand. And I fail every time. Like I got my pancit down. I can, I can hold myself. But when somebody's like, can you make a miswa? I'm like, Pfft. no. Um, and it has bitter, <laughs> it has bitter melon in it too, right? Which is like so medicinal. Um, and so beautiful, and really not for the faint of heart. Like I would, I would be like, okay, I'm a, I'm authentically Filipino. I can, <laughs> I can hold myself down. I mean, forget the balot, but I was like, yeah, I, I could do this. But if anybody knows me, actually, I will eat anything with bagoong on it. Mm -hmm. I'm from Pangasinan, so like, mm. I would get like fresh pressed coconut oil. I would get when I'd get there, just be jars of bagoong, and it was, it's a time. You know it's really good, like when you make adobo, like at the last minute, toss in a little bit of funky bagong, yeah. and woo! <laughs> Look at that, that funk, adobo. It's everything. Yeah. It's good, yeah. I think everybody's adobo just like went up by like 20%. Um, if I can just say one thing about laying <laughs> before I have to choose Advocate. another dish. I think that, you know, 
taro leaves are really difficult to cook with because if you do something wrong, then your throat itches. So I think that they're difficult. And I remember because I wanted to put, so I, when I did my Filipino piece for the Times, they wanted to run some recipes. And I asked Romy Doratan for a recipe for laying. But he insisted, you know, taro leaves, no substitutions. And that's, so for our readers, we have to, you know, if you're in the middle of nowhere, how do you get taro leaves? Mm -hmm. He's like, no, they can get taro leaves and they have to get taro leaves and it is not the same dish without taro leaves. So we couldn't run the recipe. Um, <laughs> But I thought, I loved that it, it was so, you know, made, it, some people make it, some Filipino restaurants have made it with kale in Brooklyn. <laughs> and it's delicious. But to him, that was not lying. It's about texture, no? Because yeah. lying is so mushy. There's something comforting about it. Kale has so much spine. Yeah. I, I, yes. So it totally makes sense. Um, I have to say, and this isn't so much that this is the dish that I would eat, but so when my mother, you know, comes to New York, and I remember the first time that I took her to, um, to a Filipino restaurant in New York. And again, I didn't grow up eating Filipino food because she didn't really cook. Um, and the way her face lit up when she saw that crispy pata was on the menu. And my mother is a very small woman. And crispy pata is a gigantic dish. You know, for those of you who don't know, it's the gigantic, you know, pig's knuckle, pig's foot. And it came, I remember, with a steak knife stab right in it, straight up, like Excalibur, you had to pull it from the stone. And I felt that this was the essence of being Filipino, was a very tiny woman <laughs> eating this dish all by herself. <laughs> I love that. What about you, Sarah? Yes, I will say that she's a great cook. I like cooking. I like cooking. Um, I'll say that. I grew up going to church like all the time, all the time. And so sitting in church with all the other Filipinos, around like 15 minutes before the sermon was, would be done, you could hear everybody's stomach like growling. <laughs> and I just remember like it was like a dam, like the tidal wave of my hunger. And by the time we got to my Lola's house, there'd be like a huge spread of food. And what I love about this kind of understanding of food. It's a lifestyle. It's not just what you eat, but it's how you live. So my family would just, we just pig out until you get sleepy, right? And so I would watch um, Kung Fu theater while everybody fell asleep around me. And then you just get back up and then you eat more, <laughs> right? And then I just loved how evening, sort of early evening would come through the windows and it's like, the whole day was like just gone in this sort of soporific sort of spell of like eating and being together and um, and sharing. So okay, so that's my my memory. Um, so being mindful of time, though, like I want to sort of open it up to maybe a couple of questions from you guys, and maybe also like a memory you might want to share as well. Because again, I loved what Lagaya said about. Um, that Filipino food is a kind of co-created venture between eater, between cook, that you're always cooking together. So um, we can kind of have that in this room with us as we speak to each other now. So yes, um, any questions, thoughts, comments? Hi, um, I just wanted to thank everyone so much. Maraming um, salamat po for coming together. And uh, I mean, kind of tayo is what my mom's been saying to me to start eating since I was an infant. So it's really cool to see amazing writers in one group. And um, yeah, P uh, Phoenix writers in one group. So uh, there's that. But since it's all got really heavy, it made me feel a lot of things. So I'm going to ask an equally heavy question. What's your Jollibee order? <laughs> Peach mango pie. Yeah. Drops mic. <laughs> well, you know, I'd like to go to the one in Queens because the one in Manhattan was lacking. <laughs> Jersey City's great. Jersey City's no, Jolly Bee's the there. shit. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, I wanted to try their palabok and condiments and. Um, I was surprised that they thought people in Manhattan couldn't handle it or something. I mean, I was truly upset. I went home, I couldn't sleep, you know. But the peach mango pie was, yeah. 
I like the sugar spaghetti. <laughs> um, another question or thoughts, comments? Maybe there's sushi. Yeah. Are we in a food coma? We're, I think we're in a, maybe we're in a food coma right now, <laughs> which is my favorite place to be. <coughs> Any other questions, thoughts? This is Hi, so um, one question about adobo. So I grew up I grew up in the Philippines and I was um, immersed in so many different types of adobo. There's red adobo, green adobo, white adobo, your mom's adobo, which is supposed to be the best adobo, and then you try your other friends and it's like, oh, it's kind of better. <laughs> but like, how, like, you know, when you look at cookbooks and uh, you're trying to decide which recipe, how do you, you know, what's, there's like a classic ad adobo recipe, like what do you, well, how do you like handle that predicament where you're like, there, it's just like a diaspora of different adobos, you know? Like, what do you do? What, how how do you reconcile with that? I think there's your own um, instincts, and like cook with your guts, you know. Um, there are certain things you want out of a dish. I think you know if you have your lying, there's something you're longing for in that particular. Um, dish, and if you're going to try to replicate it, that that's what you're going to strive for. And I demand a lot out of my adobo. Um, you know, um, I had this friend, Andrew, who made really great adobo. And we started experimenting with bagoong, like right when you're sauteing it at the end, when you're kind of braising it. you. And I love that. I mean, my mother didn't make adobo like that, and hers was really good, but different, you know? I mean, it was more classic. Um, so I think your taste buds change, and you should just trust what you love, you know? Um, you know what you want out of a dish, I think, and I think we're all too scared to follow a recipe. You know, we're always thinking, well, what's, what's not the right thing? There's nothing authentic. It's, it's a... It is what it is. It was improvised, right? Yeah. I'm a loyalist, so if my mom were alive, I would be like, my mom's is the best. <laughs> How'd she make it? I mean, she was very classic. She was very classic. That's yummy. Yeah, and hella, yeah. hella bay leaf, like hella bay leaf, hella peppercorns. Like it was very <laughs> pungent. Um, that was, but for me, body memory is a thing. So it's, uh, when I would ask my family, like, so American when I was younger, I was like, how do you measure it? My Lola, like, buck cackled at me. She was like, <laughs> like I, she was just like, just do this and smell. Nah. Just like, everything was do this and smell. Do this and taste. What does it smell like? What is the color like? So she engaged me, my family engaged me. It was such a natural mm -hmm. gift. Those senses, it's like, what is it? Cooking, cooking elaborates in a way that poetry does. So it was very clear. So I feel like with adobo, it's really, what does your body memory tell you? You know, like what, what is, right yeah, now. yeah, what do you want right now? And also like sometimes I have my mom's voice in the back of my head, so I could still hear being like, hey, not like that, nope. <laughs> not enough, Ugh, not good, you know? So sometimes that helps me. We're unpacking that. <laughs> I suggest you do whatever your body mind tells you to do. I think one of my favorite things about adobo is that there's a, you can make it you can be so simple and it can just blow everybody away. Like just blow everyone away. And so my favorite is a sort of very classic, um, I forgot his name, like Ronaldo. Do you know that cookbook? Alejandro. Yes, Alejandro, yeah. yes, yes. And because I like that he broils it at the very end so you get kind of that crispy like black char um, at the end. Um, and I like to add like coconut milk, like Bicolano yes, style. The, like the coconut milk is a shit. I love that. But it's like, it's like you just, you just put it all together. Like, that's the thing. Like, adobo is like low maintenance, but like hardcore, like dividends, like coming back to you. It's like you put it all together, you ignore it for a while, stick it in the oven, and then it's like, it's like done. It's amazing. Um, anyway, Lagaya, any thoughts on adobo? So, I mean, <laughs> so, you know, the, again, my mother was not the cook. So my dad, who grew up in Liverpool, England, was the one who made adobo in our house. <laughs> so that was my adobo. And um, he obviously made it well enough to please my mother. Yeah. Um, and it was very soy heavy. 
So every adobo since has been a revelation in some way, because I didn't realize there was such a range. And I will say, so my husband, who is not Filipino, he's also the cook in my family. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a cook either. I'm taking after my mother. Um, so he cooks for my mother. She adores him, worships anything he cooks. But one day he made adobo for her, and it is the only time she has expressed reservations. She <laughs> worships him, and she was like, hmm. <laughs> it was delicious. So clearly, I think everybody has their taste. And my taste for adobo is vinegar. I like it on the vinegar side more than the soy side. So, um, But I'm also open to, I don't know if I've ever had it with coconut milk. So I am open to discovering. I think maybe we, maybe there should be an adobo cookbook. Maybe that's... Or adobo cook-off. There was. <laughs> we did one at uh, Purple Yam. Uh, well, actually it was Cendralon when he still had Cendralon. Yeah. Yes. And I, Ice was sort of talking to Ami and Romy, and I said, well, why don't we just do an Adobo Olympics? <laughs> and she actually took me seriously and invited all these, I invited my friends to cook their version, but she invited these serious chefs. So it was like this crazy, were you there, Bing? It, I didn't even know. There was the dry kind, mm -hmm. very dry then a very saucy, and then there was the this and the that, and and we all had to eat them and rate them, and oh yeah. Oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> uh, I was kind of like, I was gonna pass out. It was amazing though, so you could do this at home. Yeah. Invite like 10 different people to do their version. It was, it was eye-opening, it was for me. And the different regions, because of course they knew who to, you know, these were, Okay, we know what we're doing now. Hashtag Adobo Olympics, hashtag. right? Everybody back in their hometowns. Like, it's going to happen. And hashtag AAWW, too, right? And when you do that. Um, so, mindful of time. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Stay a little bit later. Let's trade more recipe secrets. I think there's a little bit more Show wine there. Sign books. Yes, there, there's books here. There's books here of our like lovely, lovely readers. Thank you so much for coming out. I'm really hungry right now. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Again, thank you to the Writers Workshop.